Welcome back to the Marching to Madness College Basketball Zoomcast podcast with Coach Michael Fly at Florida Gulf Coast University. Coach Fly begins his fourth season with the Eagles. And Coach, I, I know uh, you guys were another team that was readily affected with the multiple COVID stoppages last year. And you were able to just play nine Atlantic Sun games, which was three fewer than anybody else. Yeah, it was hard on our group. Uh, we started the year five and two with a, a win over Miami and Coral Gables. We're off to our best start in several years. Uh, came into league play, and our before our first two league games, we were shut down, no practice, no weights for two weeks. Uh, I think we practiced two or three days and then played back-to-back -back games. So I, I joked with people, no, no disrespect to – Bellerman, I thought they did a great job, but I don't think we could have beat a high school team either one of those nights just from a conditioning standpoint. So uh, came back and went four and two in our games after that. Once we kind of got back in shape, uh, got shut down again. So that's two weeks again, no practice, no lifting. Um, I think we played, I think I did the math. We, I think we played one college basketball game in 26 days um, and then went into the conference tournament. So uh, we were fortunate, to be honest with you, to win any games in the conference tournament because by that point, you know, from a, a conditioning and rhythm standpoint, we were so far behind. Uh, I was thrilled that we got one win, um, but we just did not feel like it was a very good representation of our team. Uh, not only did we just play the nine games, but we only played six games where we'd been able to practice basketball for two weeks before. <laughs> so, Oh, my uh, gosh. Yeah, so it was it was really hard even as a coach to get any sense of, you know, how good we were, how could we, how good we could have been, you know, were we the team that beat Miami and Coral Gables and, and you know, played really well against Lipscomb and North Alabama, who, you know, were, were towards the top of the league and North Alabama played in the title game, we went two and one against both those teams. Or were we the team who was not very good coming out of COVID for three games? You know, I, I can't tell you, but uh, we talked a lot in the locker room after the the loss to North Alabama to go to the championship game. Those guys went and again credit them that hey, we we can't we can't allow um, next season to be wasted because we felt like last season, you know, out of out of a lot of our guys' control was a little bit of a waste. So the seniors talked about take care of business next year, you know, do it for us. Uh, and we've we've kind of all come back with a mission and a little bit of a chip on our shoulder that I don't think anybody got to see um, what we thought was really our team last season. Uh, and, and such a tough, uh, you know, it's a great outline that you've given us there. I, again, lots of people don't realize everybody's journey was different. And then, you know, where all that stands. Yeah, I was happy for my friends in the business that were, you know, able to play a big portion of our of their schedule. Uh, but I really felt for the guys that, um, you know, th that were judged based on their their seasons last year and felt so badly for the seniors in college basketball, the ones that did not come back. Uh, and I talked about even with our group, I mean, our seniors, there was no senior night. We missed senior night. You know, it was just kind of uh, kind of a sad um, ending to a lot of guys career. But, you know, again, I hope that this group plays with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder that, again, I'm, I'm not sure anybody can really know who we were last year. Kevin Samuel, a 6'11", 235-pound center as a three-year starter at TCU, and he led the Big 12 in block shots. Can, it, can you talk a little bit about bringing him on and uh, how I, I guess you're going to play through him because you do have a lot of bigs on your roster? Yeah, he, he's actually closer to 260, 6'11", 260. I think he's got about a 7'5 wingspan or so. Um, yeah, we're excited about Kevin. He can really, really defend both in pick and roll and at the rim, can really block shots and rebound. Uh, his offensive game is good, but is still developing. Um, we are going to have a chance to play more uh, through the interior than we've been able to in the last couple of years, not just with him, but with some of our other guys as well. But, um, you know, Kevin comes in as a guy that you know, as long as he's healthy and, and running up and down the floor, you know, you feel like you have a pretty good sense of what you can expect because there's a really big sample size and what a lot of people would argue um, was the best league in college basketball the last couple of years. So um, he's a, a really, really good kid, team leader, 
um, you know what you're going to get from an effort standpoint with him. Just great um, character guy, in addition to being a really good basketball player. So, um, you know, I, I think he will alter shots in this league and, and rebound at a level that um, is hard to find at the mid-major level. And then we're going to try to get him as many opportunities offensively as we can. Well, Carlos Rosario is another big, a 6'8 transfer from McNeese. Uh, really known for his play around the basket. I think his effective field goal percentage I read was 62.9. So talk about pairing those two guys. Are you going to put them on the floor a lot together? Yeah, you know, it's funny you said that. We're trying to figure out, you know, how to get the best players on the court all the time. And sometimes you have That's to be a good creative. thing. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to be creative. You know, sometimes it doesn't work out just, you know, hey, one, two, three, four, five. Sometimes you got to play multiple bigs together, put as many guards on the court that can help you. So uh, we've got some things, I think, in our system that's going to allow those guys to play on the floor at the same time because uh, they are so effective. Uh, but obviously, you want to space the floor. You want to be able to have shooting as well. So uh, there will be times that they share the floor together, but we feel pretty confident. You know, if one of those two guys is man in the middle, um, you like what you've got at that center position. Or, or like I said, if you're going to play big, um, at this level, having both of those guys that can score on the block, that can rebound, that um, have played, you know, at least individually have had success at the division one level. Um, you know, we have not had that from that from that kind of center position in the last few years here. So, um, Carlos, you brought it up as a highly efficient player. Uh, <coughs> we laugh. He he missed a shot around the rim in a scrimmage the other day, and we all kind of were taken back because we're not used to him missing. I mean, he finishes, it seems like, everything around the rim, and he's a very good free throw shooter to be a big. So I think he's really going to help us offensively for sure and is, is continuing to get better defensively. Yeah, a uh, freshman last year, Zach Anderson, it got on the court. Uh, talk about what he brought you when he was out there. Yeah, it's interesting. Most freshmen come in, you know, ahead of the curve offensively, but it's hard for them to get on the court because they're not very good defensively. Uh, Zach can really pass. He can put it on the deck. Uh, he can play multiple positions. He struggled to shoot the ball last year. So that's something that we've worked on a lot in the offseason. But uh, outside of his shooting ability, I mean, you couldn't ask for a more prepared freshman. I mean, he really rebounds at a high level. He can guard one through five legitimately. Uh, he's one of the best talkers in our program on the back line. Um, when we were able to beat Lipscomb in the ASUN tournament, I couldn't take him off the floor. He was too good. Rebounding, defending. Uh, if the jump shot continues to develop, you know, he's got a chance to be very, very good when his offense catches up with his defense. But he just – our guys are very confident when he's on the court because he just brings a level of toughness and, and a lot of intangibles that sometimes don't show up on the stat sheet. We're talking, of course, about uh, the post players, and then we go look at your guards, and you're in really good hands with Cyrus Lar Largy and Caleb Cotto. Both averaged over 13 points a game as a backcourt. Can you talk a little bit about how they play, you know, off each other and how important that is to have cohesion back there? It's, it's like it's already, you know, a finely glued unit. Yeah. So they're, they're an interesting duo, if you will. You know, if you compare their numbers to a lot of the guys that were selected on the all league team last year, their numbers are just as good or better than some of those guys, but most of the league didn't see them play and didn't play against them. So, you know, I've made it clear to them, Hey, you guys had all league numbers last year, but neither one of them are selected because we played nine games. Uh, and like I said, we played six healthy. So Again, kind of theme of our team, a little bit of a chip on both of their shoulders, I think, for not being recognized individually uh, based on what they did, you know, from a statistical standpoint. Uh, both of those guys really impact winning. I mean, you talk about from a character standpoint, both on the court and off the court, uh, they try to do everything you ask them to do. Um, they're the type of guys that you want to build your program around in terms of building blocks, uh, like I said, both on the court and off. Uh, they're different in their approach. You know, Cyrus is a physical downhill driver. He was one of the better rebounding guards in the country. Uh, can shoot the ball percentage-wise with his feet set, but he loves to rip it and attack the rim as much as possible. 
Uh, he is a demon with the ball in transition. I mean, he, he'll beat guys down the floor himself sometimes as a primary ball handler in, in a transition situation, but just tough, physical, um, just so competitive. Caleb shares some, some similarities in terms of um, wanting to win at a high, high level, high level of compete. Um, his game is different in that he's at his best catching and shooting off of screens. Um, space in the floor. He can attack off the bounce, off rip through situations, and in some occasional ball screens. A really good passer and playmaker as a secondary ball handler. Uh, and he's legitimately 6'5. And so, um, you know, you can switch with him. But man, when those two guys are on the court, I'm very comfortable as a head coach because I know I've got two wing players that can defend, can shoot, can, can pass the ball. And more than anything, both of those guys. They both those guys could care less if they scored two points or 20 points as long as we win the game. Yeah. And, and then you got TV and Dunn Martin coming in. He uh, scored 883 points at Akron and Duquesne. What's he going to add to the team now? And of course, scoring, but I mean, in other ways. <laughs> Yeah, I just think he's a he's a change of pace guard. I mean, last year, Luis Rallone, who we'll talk about, had a tremendous freshman year when he was healthy, uh, but he's very different than Tavian. Tavian is a fast twitch um, combo point guard who can really get downhill, change direction. Uh, he's dynamic as a playmaker and ball handler because he's so fast with the ball and he's so low to the ground that it's it's just hard to control him. Uh, we've challenged Tavian. I know he can score. He's going to have big scoring nights. Uh, we've challenged him to to play as a true point guard as well uh, because we've got so many tools and weapons around him. So when he gets in that paint and kicks, you know, it, it, he's really tough to deal with because it's just hard to keep him out of the paint. So he's done a really good job of that in our scrimmages and the preseason of buying into that. Um, he's got to be able to pressure the ball for us out front. Uh, but he's just he's he's very different than anybody we've had in the last three years or so in terms of just dynamic playmaking and scoring from that point guard position. As far as Luis goes, where have you seen him pick his game up most maybe since the end of last season? Yeah, Luis, you know, had a had a frustrating freshman year because when he played and was healthy, we were a much different team than when he didn't. Um, he was a major cog in the machine to, to beating Miami. Uh, he, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen a guy impact a game with passing ability like he did against Lipscomb in the A-Sun tournament. Uh, I don't think he scored a basket and he dominated the game. I think he had nine assists and, and five or six steals and probably could have had 12 or 13 assists if guys had finished. Um, but he was very up and down from an injury standpoint. You know, he, he played um, through the preseason, through the non-conference. He got hurt before uh, he played in two games against Bellarmine, got hurt before we played Lipscomb and then played one game in the conference tournament, tried to give it a go in a second game and just couldn't do it physically. Uh, had some off-season surgery, is still working himself back into shape. Uh, when Luis is, is healthy, we're, we're hard to deal with in terms of transition and, and playmaking because he is, he is as good a passer as we've had since Brett Comer. Uh, he led the league in assists and steals on a per-game average. Now, it won't show up in the standings because he didn't play enough games. Uh, but per game, if you average it out, he led the league in both categories. So uh, just a winner, led our team in charges, um, tough as nails, and gives us, I mean, that that's about, I think, at this level, if he's healthy, you know, the the kind of yin and yang of him and Tavian Dunmartin is about as good as you can do uh, in terms of that point guard position. So uh, we're just hoping that he gets back to 100%. He's still working his way through that right now. But just a gifted uh, player who, again, I, I think he contributes to winning in a major way. Obviously, this sounds like it's your t most talented and deepest team you've had there. Is that correct? Well, I'll, I'll let you know. We'll talk about that in, in March. Uh, okay. But I, I, think, I think we've got some pieces. I think, you know, the, the nice thing about this group is, you know, you bring back some guys that have, have done it with our jersey on and have proved they can be productive. Uh, but there's also an influx of guys that have proved they can do it at the Division One level and other places. But I, I'll get back to you on that comment in, okay. in, uh, in early March. 
What's the, there you go. Early March. Hey, you know, we'll, we'll see where Dunk City, uh, you know, it may be the revival or the, or the, or the rise, the renaissance. Um, hey, we, we, we just want to be, we just want to be winning city. <laughs> however we winning do it. city. Yeah, there you go. With dunks, three pointers, defense, how, whatever. However we get it done. Hey, I was going to ask uh, with this much depth and talent, uh, what are the biggest challenges yeah, I think a few things. I think guys accepting roles. I mean, if you just put all of our guys down on paper, guys, if there's there's some players that have had a ton of individual success. Um, nobody on this team has played in the NCAA tournament. So I think it's really important that we all have that common goal uh, to, to get to the NCAA tournament. Um, I think that, you know, based on, you know, I'll knock on wood when I say this, but based on the scrimmages we've had with other teams and based on our practice, um, I feel pretty good about us on the offensive end in terms of shooting the ball, in terms of being able to score points. Uh, what I've challenged our group on is you, you, you have to be as concerned with defense and rebounding as you are with the shots going in. Uh, I think we're going to have to challenge our guys that um, you got to get your energy from the defensive end, not from the offensive end. Uh, and all, you know, we have, 13 scholarship guys and three walk-ons we talk about all the time we got to be 16 strong there can't be guys that you know because they're not playing they're upset because their stats are not as good as maybe they were at their previous school or the last year it's got to all be about winning so those I think are going to be the challenges um defining roles people buying into those roles uh and an ultimate focus on winning over individual statistics I was going to ask you also, uh, you guys have got a couple of marquee names, I guess, in college basketball coming there early. Uh, Southern Cal with Andy Enfield, who uh, took the Eagles uh, to the to Sweet 16, I think, in 2013. And you and I talked, you were on that staff and, of course, came with him from Florida State. And then Rhode Island plays there a week later. Yeah, it's going to be a heck of a test. We also go at Loyola Chicago uh, on the 13th. So we go Loyola Chicago on the 13th on the road, USC on the 16th and Rhode Island on the 23rd. So we're going to find out quickly, you know, what we're made of. Uh, but we've always done that here. We've always played a really challenging schedule. Uh, the hopes, you know, in doing that is that you're so battle tested that when you get to the A-Sun and specifically the A-Sun tournament that, you know, you're ready to go and, and you've seen everything and been in every situation. Uh, so those are all going to be really challenging games. Uh, but I, I think good players want to play hard games. And so yeah. it'll be a heck of a way to start the season. Uh, but I also think that we'll find a, out a lot about who we are. Uh, and I think those games will help us down the road. Last thing, Coach, it's interesting. The A-Sun is in transition, too, with new teams. You have Eastern Kentucky, Jacksonville State, and Central Arkansas. Talk about the dynamics of adding those teams. Ooh, the league, we've talked about this within the league. Um, even the last two to three years, the league has gotten back to the point it was when Coach Enfield and I first came into the league, which was really good top to bottom. Um, there's not a night that you can just take off and, oh, we'll win this one if we just show up. You know, there's been times in this league that maybe you could get a couple of wins by just showing up and playing hard. And th those days are over. I mean, I, I think that um, what Coach Harper's done at Jacksonville State, what Coach, Coach uh, Hamilton's done at Eastern Kentucky, uh, both those guys are personal friends and guys that I've followed in the business and followed their careers. I think that they're going to be um, really good in this league. I mean, they were competing at the top of the OVC. Um, obviously, Jacksonville State went to uh, the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago. Uh, so I think the league top to bottom is really, really competitive. Um, you know, even in trying to figure out preseason predictions and all that, I mean, I, I think there's five six teams that if they wanted it wouldn't surprise me um so it's going to be a war and I think like I said when I came into the league it was Belmont Mercer East Tennessee State South Carolina Upstate I mean it, it was it was just a we were all mauling each other the whole year and I think we're back to that I mean I think if you take one night off you get beat mm -hmm. 
So it's uh it's a good thing from a competitive standpoint, uh, but we got to be on our game every night. Coach Michael Fly, of the Florida Gulf Coast Eagles. Coach, I'm planning on heading down when USC comes in on the 16th, so maybe we can actually chat up there at some point uh, before or after the game. Yes, sir. Come and see us. We'd love to have you.